Hi, I'm Hilary, this is session 33, and we are with Jesus and Nicodemus in what is an incredible conversation. From his early recorded words, Jesus has been introducing the concept of being sent, of his death, and even of his resurrection. He seems to know from the start of his ministry that this is the plan. Destroy this temple slash my body, and in three days, God will raise it up again. Now responding to Nicodemus, he is going to raise the subject of his ascension. We considered last session that Nicodemus's heart is turning, that he has already taken those first breaths um, of spiritual life after spiritual birth. The umbilical cord has been broken and Jesus sees that he is ready for some milk, some nutritious spiritual truths. And Jesus titles this nutrition as heavenly things. And I noticed that he again links it back to Nicodemus's opening statement, which we will remind ourselves of. Rabbi, we know you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus takes this one big step further. He didn't just come from God, he says, he descended. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. <laughs> Funnily enough, it made me think of how we say, I am descended from some famous clan or person or royalty. Now that's not the context here, but it's a little layer I hadn't seen before. Now back in the actual context, Jesus is raising the subject of his ascending. That's an unintentional pun. He is saying that yes, he came from heaven, remember Nicodemus's question, and he is also going to go back to heaven. Cue a messianic prophecy. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. This is from the time the Israelites spoke against God. And despite many signs and miracles that they had been sent, they just didn't trust him or the one whom God had sent to them, Moses. That's the first linking layer with Jesus and Nicodemus's conversation. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus brings up a time God's people did not believe. They, the people, spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food, which was every day a miracle that they got to witness. And the consequence is that the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so many people of Israel died. Now, maybe like me, your mind goes back to the beginning, in the garden, with the story of the snake and the choice not to trust or not to believe in God and the resulting loss of eternal life. Jesus pulls this story of redemption into Nicodemus's and our timeline. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we've spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. And then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it, he will live. Just like them, we are bitten, we are dying. But if we turn, looking upward to a risen and ascended saviour, we will live eternally. Now the snake being set up on a standard or on a pole is often taught about Jesus being lifted up on the cross. But I hadn't seen before that the subject here is actually about him ascending into heaven. Jesus is tracking with the subject that Nicodemus brought up, that he knows Jesus comes from God. So still within this clear context of descending and ascending, he is going to expand on that. For God so loved the world that he gave, he sent down, descended his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, looks on him, shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. 
My fresh thoughts on this passage are that Jesus keeps the focus on being sent from and returning to or raised back up to heaven. And while his death or the destruction of his body, as he puts it in his temple metaphor, is a necessary part of that, the focus stays on us believing in his resurrection and his ascension. That's interesting. The reference here is Jesus saying later on, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death and into life. Believing is the key. We're back in the passage, it's verse 18, and I'm in the New Living Translation this time. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but everyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. Now he takes a moment here to explain how that judgment comes. It is based on this fact. God's light came into the world but the people loved darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear that their sins will be exposed. Whose actions bring the judgment? It seems here it is the humans. We want to keep that darkness that covers up everything nicely, but the judgment, the consequence of that action is we keep ourselves in the dark and we miss the opportunity to live in the light, to live but those who do what is right. And the context for what is right here is believing in the Son and in the one who sent him. We come to the light so others can see what we're doing and that we're doing what God wants. They can see our faith and the effect that it is having. You know, sometimes Jesus will throw these seemingly obscure kind of statements at people, parables beyond their comprehension. But this conversation demonstrates the master teacher at work, following his students' understanding, building on it and challenging new thinking. He's deepening Nicodemus's knowledge and encouraging him on his journey. It really is a master class. And this is as far as I got to with this passage, but of course, there are so many more layers to it. These big subjects of judgment, of eternal life, etc., they're going to crop up again and again, and we are going to be ready when they do. I'm going to see you next time.